So this is a new, this actually was inspired by Richard in his original book, where in, I think, the first chapter, he talked about the many voices that the world speaks about peak oil. And so the whole idea of looking at future scenarios and understanding the probabilities that we're all assigning to those scenarios is something we started adding to our talks. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually talk about, first of all, some of the scenarios, much like Richard did with his scenario one, two, and three. And then I'm going to actually ask you to create your very own peak, prob, pre, pe, personal peak probability profile. And why should you do this? Well, as we've been doing these literally, we've been doing energy workshops since 1991. John's been presenting on peak oil since 97. We have had enormous amounts of opportunity to converse with the public, not just the choir. And we noticed that there is a vast difference between the people that are speaking on this topic and where they're coming from and the people that are listening to this topic and where they are coming from, all relative to these futures that Richard talked about. So we think in order to become a better listener, a better consumer now of even what Richard talks about, I mean, is what Richard said, is it true? We have to look at how we're viewing the world and filtering that information for ourselves to see what our own biases are. And we also have to understand what the speaker's biases are. So we actually begin our workshops by telling people what our biases are when we speak about this topic. So we're going to let you guys quickly, maybe together, we'll discover and I'll show you my personal peak probability profile. So this is a chart done by the founder of the permaculture movement, um, David Holgram. And it's just one of the ways that they're beginning to model the future. Don't worry about it. It's, it's kind of busy. But in general, the idea is exactly what Richard talked about. It's exactly what we learned about in the web of debt. It's what we learned about when we listened to that climate thing, which is we have begun a curve that almost looks the identical way when you look at gross domestic product, population, energy. It's always the same curve. We're amazed if you put it all up. Waste, pollution, carbon dioxide. It's always the curve that happened about 250 years during the Industrial Revolution. And David postulates that we are going to, at some point, as Richard mentioned, reach a climax. This data now is clear, and everybody's talking about it. What is unclear, and what no one knows, we don't know, is what is it going to look like for the next 250 years while this thing reveals itself. And of course, it's a self-feedback loop. We may be able to impact it. So you're guessing into something that then we could very well change. So we postulate four scenarios. There could be hundreds, but let's just say for simplicity, these four scenarios which map up with Richard's scenarios. He says we could have, there are those that believe that we will create this unlimited modern society, we will grow population, we will grow our use of the environment, waste, our, forget web of debt, we will figure a way to do more debt, and we will simply grow this curve in the future. So it's the red line, and we call that techno explosion. And we do that because somehow we reinvent something. I'm thinking people are expecting that the Google guys are going to come up with some new fusion pod that's going to take care of free energy and some magic new web of debt on top of it squared and somehow it doesn't hurt the environment. And don't imagine that there are not people out there that believe that this is the greatest hope. Richard talked about it and called it the magic elixir. This probably is the most prevalent thing that we face when we do these talks. It is out there as a meme that is extraordinary and difficult to get through because technology always saved us, every time. Why not this time? So that is one scenario. The second, and the second scenario says we do not get to grow our population anymore. We do not get to grow the use of our environment, the amount of waste, pollution, our GDP. We actually do what Richard talked about. We create in this techno-stability environment, a steady state gross domestic product. We will not be doing the web of debt. We will somehow have to freeze it. And this is kind of shocking to economists because that means we will not be growing our GDP. That means you can't say we're growing 2% a year. We're going to be possibly down for a while and then stabilize at some high level. Roughly the level of our population today or slightly lower. Roughly to the level of our standard of living today, how we transport ourselves. And most people believe this can occur through a seamless conversion to renewables. And that meme or that idea is out there strong in the listening. 
and in many of us in how we speak about this, that we can somehow get to the, if we can go green fast enough, we can get to this future without fundamentally lowering the population too much or the general industrial society's infrastructure. So that's, scenario, that's number two. Uh, let me go to the, the, the black one, the darker one. And I'm sure you've heard speakers on this, and some of what Richard says actually kind of is, you get scared about it, and then he comes back and gets you hope. So I think Richard drops you into collapse, and then he comes back with the hope. The collapse model says the climax will happen so fast, much like this economic problem, that we are going to fall off the cliff before we can salvage the fo core fundamental elements of our civilization. We cannot save the infrastructure. And there will be epidemics because maybe the global climate change happens at the same time that the uh, economics fail at the same time that we suddenly have this massive peak oil. It could be that the three biggies hit together and Richard's great idea of working together in new green deals are just not fast enough. There was no runway. The plane will crash. That is the, you know, the Mad Max scenario. And it's very, very, very doomsday. And you will hear that in yourself sometimes and certainly we see that some people really take that view that there is no other hope. And then there's this new kind of one that I think Richard's really talking about and that is called energy descent. He, he actually calls it power down I believe. You titled the book on it. Uh, and this is the one where we don't collapse all the way down to some level and if you look at the thing this is 10,000 years before petroleum so this may be I don't know a billion people. 500 million, we, we don't collapse back down to that level, we collapse to a slightly higher level and we do it in steps such that we have many recession depressions drop down, lose certain parts of our society as we get along with less until we reach a sustainable level that has been literally built from the bottom up, prepared for this loss of, of our economic infrastructure. So those are, the, those are the four basic scenarios that you're gonna see people have and that you have. The question is, when people ask us, and they ask John this, well, which way is it going to be? And we have no idea. Nobody knows. But what people do know is they probably put a probability against those scenarios. It gets more interesting when David starts really looking at the energy descent scenario. So let's look at the scenario I think Richard's betting on. He's saying that there's something we're going to be able to do that's not going to, to totally collapse us, but we're probably not going to be saved by the Green Revolution or some new Google iFusion pod device. And so what he says is, let's just take two variables and modify them. One is called, how fast is the oil going to decline? So he runs an axis that shows peak oil declining very fast over here, or over on this side, if you can see my pointer, and very slow on the left side of the x-axis. And then it says, will we have benign or destructive climate change? And depending on whether you have those two intermixed variables, will create a very different set of sub-scenarios in how we go through this energy descent. So he actually tells us we should all look very carefully at whether we believe in which of those variables, and as we vary them, we will see different types of environments, some that are very survivalistic with, with both peak oil and climate change happening together, but some that actually give you the chance to roll out your green, renewable, lower energy, one-tenth the energy civilization, because the climate wasn't so destructive that you couldn't even build the windmills. And the peak oil declines were slow enough that you could use the last remaining oils to roll out your infrastructure. And then he gives us one last concept, which is each of those solutions or scenarios for the future actually vary by geography. We're noticing that when we talk to people, they say, well, are you, aren't the tar sands one of the big solutions? I mean, that's 200 billion barrels worth of oil. And it probably is in coal for the national debate. And you saw it in, in Obama's plan. We saw nuclear, we saw coal. These are kind of brown tech solutions. And at the national level, we probably will see a lot of brown tech discussion. But at the state level, we're noticing you can have a totally different conversation at the green tech level. In other words, rolling out at a state level green technologies. At the local community, people are talking about community farming. And at the household level, many of us are talking about almost survivalist things in case everything breaks down. How do we take care of our family? OK, with that back, that was a, it would take five hours to really go through those solutions. But just roughly get an idea that there's a complex set of scenarios, but we can simplify those to kind of look at what the future might hold. And this is over 250 years. So this is some long-term visioning. 